Hello and welcome to Horizon HealthWorks, presented by Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey. I'm Laura Jones. We are in Homedale at the Visiting Nurse Association corporate headquarters. In today's episode, an inside look at how to avoid COVID scammers trying to rip you off. We'll meet Eric Knapp, whose life was literally saved when he rescued his first pet. Details on how the Visiting Nurse Health Group, which started right here in Monmouth County, supports over 120,000 people every day, and of course, our Person of the Month. First, how to start the delicate conversation in your own family when it comes time to bring in long-term care. Joining me now is Dr. Stephen Landers, the President and CEO of the Visiting Nurse Association. We thank you for coming to talk to us a little bit about home health care, and I was hoping you could define what home health care really is. Thanks for meeting with me and to talk about my favorite topic, which is, which is home health care. So uh, as a family doctor and uh, geriatrician, uh, one of the most important things for me is how do you help people stay healthy at home, uh, particularly as they age or maybe have chronic illness. And, and home health care are all the services and supports that might be available to help somebody at home. So this includes nursing care, uh, home health aid services, uh, sometimes more uh, telehealth or telemedicine at home is part of what we would now consider, consider home health care. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about aging at home, and I think that is a difficult conversation to start with your parents. How would you tell a parent and child to have that conversation about defining what they want? Sure. The, these conversations uh, in families are always difficult, right, around uh, sensitive topics, around around aging and uh, living arrangements and safety. I think, you know, making sure uh, that your parents know that you love them, that this is about their comfort and uh, independence, and that you want to plan ahead for a bad day so that it, uh, decisions aren't made in crisis, uh, things are set up in advance. So what kind of information should we be prepared to talk about when opening that conversation? I think some of the important things are around decision making. So who's going to make which types of decisions if, uh, if, if their loved one were to become incapacitated in some way or to have difficulty with, with memory or uh, for some other reason can't make decisions for themselves. And we call that sometimes surrogate decision making or proxy decision making, but that's really important. And more and more people are able to stay, in, stay at home as opposed to going to a skilled nursing facility or a nursing home. What has improved so that parents are, or those who are aging, are able to stay at home? One of the most rewarding parts about my work uh, in geriatric medicine and also with visiting nurse association is that we're able to help so many people uh, stay home. Uh, you know, even when they have serious medical issues, um, even with Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or other serious conditions, uh, almost everyone can stay home with, with home care supports if they plan ahead. The, the services that are available at home are quite robust. I mean, you know, nurses with special training in a whole variety of medical issues, uh, personal care supports like home health aides and other uh, personal care services. These are a really strong set of supports that can be brought to bear to help somebody stay home. So you're somebody who has witnessed this, who has been involved in going into homes yourself. Is there any type of best case scenario that you have seen that, or a, a certain model that might really work? Uh, I've fortunately been able to see many success stories and they start typically with planning ahead uh, so that it's clear uh, what roles different family members are playing. Often it involves home modification, safety measures uh, around things like the showers and the, in, in the bathrooms where falls can happen. If, if they're not set up appropriately. Even the basics like lighting and other, other safety measures being taken into account. If somebody came to you and said, listen, I've got a parent, they're aging, I don't know what to do. If they're even thinking about it and having the conversation, they're way ahead of the game. It can be difficult and, and uh, it's just uh, you know, always exciting and encouraging to hear families having the conversation in a proactive way rather than in a crisis. Uh, because a lot of times these conversations only happen when mom or dad's in the emergency room and, you know, the doctors are saying they're not sure if it's safe to send them home. And that's, you know, not when you want to have these type of, uh, you know, planning sessions. I thought it was really interesting. Someone, when I turned 50, uh, 
the financial planner was saying. You think about saving for college, saving for retirement, but not necessarily saving for home health care. What is that first step, would you say? I think that if somebody needs help, it, you know, imminently needs help, calling the Visiting Nurse Association is a great uh, place to start. Our, our care coordinators, our, our, our nurse outreach uh, liaisons will be a, a wonderful resource uh, for families. Uh, if you're not sure uh, in your community where, where to call, you can also call your area agencies on aging. So these are funded through the Older Americans Act through the federal government. There is in every uh, county and region an area agency on aging uh, where people can reach out to ask for support. Thank you, doctor. Great information. And thank you, Toby. Can I get some kisses, kisses, kisses? Well, this is Toby. And there's nothing, trust me, nothing like kisses from a warm puppy. This little gal was saved by Animal Lighthouse Rescue. And in our next story, you're going to meet Eric Knapp, who says his rescue pet saved his life, gave him purpose, and now he helps connect others with these four legged little angels. Kisses now. Among dog rescuers, there is a cliche. You don't just rescue the dog, the dog rescues you. For New Jersey resident, Eric Knapp, the decision to rescue two dogs is something he credits with saving his life. When I adopted Zelda and Lando, it was a pretty dark time in my life. The dark times were as dark as they could be. It's not just not wanting to get up in the morning, it's questioning your existence. Is, is there a point? Am I just taking up other people's air or am I contributing to the world and society? <clears throat> Adopting my dogs changed my life in a profoundly positive way. The dogs completely flipped my worldview upside down from darkness to light. The dogs gave me purpose. The dogs gave me meaning. The dogs gave me a reason to wake up in the morning. I am so grateful for my dogs. I would not be here if it wasn't for them, and every single day I'm so grateful. I adopted my two dogs about 10 years ago, and that's when I learned about the plight of the stray dogs in Puerto Rico. And a few years later, myself with my adoption counselor and a couple of other people started Animal Lighthouse Rescue. Eric Knapp's life became so enriched after rescuing his two dogs that he decided to volunteer his time to share the joy he received with others in New Jersey and the tri-state area. Seeing the dogs getting adopted is the ultimate reward and any stress we have in getting them from rescue and rehabilitation to their forever home, which is sometimes a very harrowing thing to go through, it's always worth it. The first time we see one of our dogs in their forever home on a comfortable bed with a pillow and a blanket, it's all worth it. That moment knowing they're safe, they're home now. All right, Eric Knapp, love that story. Love hearing about these rescues. John Pearson now, he is the executive director of Horizon Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us. I want to ask you a little bit about why pet therapy is so crucial. Well, thanks for having me. I mean, pet therapy is critical because as we're living through COVID-19 and you're seeing the social isolation, and when you look at you know, what animals do in terms of your home and, and helping the health and well-being of your family, it's just an incredible fit for our foundation. So that's why this project was so unique and, and really critical to the health of New Jerseyans. This caught your eye a particular book you know called home that was done by the animal lighthouse rescue was there anything in particular that really grabbed at you so this book which i'm holding is amazing it's an amazing uh tribute to all the families that have participated and it really tells a story this organization animal lighthouse rescue um, they're going to puerto rico they're rescuing these animals bringing them back to the greater New York, New Jersey area, and really connecting them to, to folks that need help. It's people rescuing animals who need a home, and then in turn, they rescue right back. Thank you, John. Absolutely. Thank you so much for talking to us. Stay with us. We will continue right after this. Since 1912, Visiting Nurse Association Health Group has been caring for our community's most vulnerable, at-risk individuals. 
Today, the mission of the VNA is more important than ever. Our 2,000 courageous caregivers are on the front lines. This has been extremely rewarding and extremely trying and extremely scary. Helping families across New Jersey, caring for patients in their homes every day. Please help us keep them safe as they work tirelessly to provide care for everyone in need. Welcome back to Horizon HealthWorks, I'm Laura Jones. Not only does the Visiting Nurse Association come to your home to provide loving home care, they also have great information and tips related to many health care conditions on their website. Joining us now is Dr. Nala Schreiber to discuss Alzheimer's disease that affects more than 5.5 million Americans over the age of 65. Can you first start by explaining to our audience what is Alzheimer's disease? Sure, thank you so much, Laura, for having me on the show today. Alzheimer's disease is the most common type of dementia in the United States. Alzheimer's disease is an irreversible and progressive deterioration of the brain. People with Alzheimer's disease have functional deficits. They're unable to tend to their home. They make mistakes on their bills. They start having problems with their medications and managing their health needs. As the disease progresses from the mild stages through to the more moderate and severe stages, people have more and more difficulty managing their bodily functions. What would you say to a family member, a caregiver, who's trying to take on all of the burdens of the patient, and they have good intentions, but they're simply not able to do that all on their own, but they want to because that's their family member. They know their family member. What would you tell them? That is a very common problem. It is really difficult to take care of a person with dementia, especially as the dementia progresses and their person's care needs increase. I would want them to know that the distress they're experiencing is very typical of what other caregivers experience. What starts in dementia is maybe just putting someone's pills in a pill box or reminding them um, to pay their bills ultimately progresses to daily physical care, including bathing, changing people's soiled undergarments, getting them dressed. So I would want caregivers to know that it's not a sign of weakness and that they're not betraying their loved one if they involve care um, to take care of this person. And really getting extra care into the home, especially again, as I said, as the disease progresses, is the reality of dementia care. On the Visiting Nurse Association website, there is helpful information about when to seek help. Can you Give us a little bit of an idea of what those items are, those signs are we should be looking for. The Visiting Nurse Association's blog addresses some of the aspects of the disease that are really difficult for family members to cope with. That is often a time where you need to involve either a geriatric case manager or a private home health aide, especially if the family is unavailable to help their loved one do some of these things. The blog mentions wandering. That's where the person gets lost. Literally, they step out of their house and they get lost in their neighborhood or they go to drive their car and they go to the grocery store, which maybe they've gone to for 20 years and they get lost going to the grocery store. And finally, the blog addresses something really important, which is the stress or the strain that caregivers are under when they care for their loved ones with dementia. And sometimes they really do need to pay, even if it's just for a few hours a week for private care so they can get a break tend to their home and even tend to their own health care needs. What are some of the home health care options available for someone with Alzheimer's and is it covered by most insurance? So that's a mixed answer. So most health insurances, including Medicare, will pay for short-term home care services, especially after the person has either been acutely medically hospitalized, um, they've had a surgery, or they've had an intercurrent illness, something like COVID, for example. Um, these home care services that companies like Visiting Nurse Association provide can include nursing care, physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy, and a limited number of home health aid hours. However, unless the person has either long-term care insurance or Medicaid, ongoing long-term home health aid support, whether it be live-in or live-out, is not typically covered by private insurers or Medicare and needs to be paid out of pocket. 
at Visiting Nurse Association, we have very skilled social workers who can help families figure out what entitlements their loved ones might qualify for. How can the caregiver make sure that they're at their best when managing this really complicated disease? Being a caregiver is a really hard job. We know that caregivers have more health problems and higher rates of depression and anxiety. The caregiver is basically managing two people's lives. They're managing their own life and that of their loved one with dementia. They can't isolate themselves. They need to cultivate their relationships with family or friends. They're gonna need a lot of social support, especially as the illness progresses and the care demands for their loved one increase. There are support groups that they can go to. The Alzheimer's Association has them virtually right now where they can realize that they're not alone and other caregivers are also struggling with some of the same things. That the caregiver is not an island unto themselves. So there's all sorts of resources they can pull, pull in, whether involving visiting nurse association, whether involving friends or family, whether involving someone like me, a psychiatrist who can help. And they need to use those resources. It's super important. It really does take a village. Thank you, Dr. Shriver. While we're at home caring for our loved ones, there's another epidemic spreading across the country too. COVID-19 scams. Everything from increased robocalls offering fake test kits to face-to-face -face offerings for on-the-spot vaccines. Joining us now is Megan Brennan, manager of Horizon Special Investigations Unit with tips on how to stay safe, secure and how to spot the fake schemes. Let's talk a little bit about how to keep yourself protected. There are sometimes people who will bill insurance for services not rendered. Patients don't always know about that or know what to look for. So how can we protect ourselves? So that's a great question. Um, one of the things that you want to remain vigilant with is protecting your member identification number. You almost want to look at it like it's your social security number, a credit card number, or even a bank card number, because once a fraudster or a scammer obtains that number, they can bill an insurance company for services not rendered. A lot of times they'll do what I call, you know, telehealth scams, where they'll reach out and basically state, if you give me your identification number, we can get you a free back brace, knee brace. There was actually a recent break, um, a criminal investigation into Medicare where they had a scheme that was over $100 million that was billed out for unnecessary back and knee braces. One of the things I want to stress the importance of is reviewing your explanation of benefits. It's entirely important to take a look because we have found in instances that providers will tack on additional charges or they'll bill, bill for a service that wasn't rendered. The most important thing that you want to focus on is the data service. You want to make sure that you check that to ensure that you were at a provider's office on that particular data service. How does this hurt the patient who may not know, they may not be being billed for anything, they're still getting the services they need, they have no idea as long as they're healthy. So believe it or not, in health insurance fraud is not a victimless crime. Um, we are actually the victims at the end of the day. Fraud um, will contribute to increased premiums. So recent estimate that I read with regards to how much it's costing us um, on a yearly basis for healthcare fraud is roughly $80 billion. So again, you may not care, um, you know, I only had to pay a copay, how is this affecting me? Well, it's coming out of our taxes. It's coming out of our paychecks. So in the age of COVID-19, are you seeing more opportunities, sadly, for people to take advantage of others? And if so, what are they? How do we protect ourselves? Man, we're seeing all types of different things. For instance, there was an article released last week, um, two gentlemen from New York, they had put out false claims that they were able to kill COVID with their air freshener. Um, so, you know, we see things like that. Um, basically, anything advertising a cure is fake. You want to stay away from those types of things. There is no cure at this time. We've heard the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, they are knocking, going door to door. Um, that's absolutely not true. If somebody comes to your door and offers you any type of COVID service, call law enforcement immediately just to be safe. Because again, anybody soliciting at your door with free kits or any type of service, it is a red flag and law enforcement should be notified. So there's nobody who's coming that would present identification that looks legitimate? It could be, but um, all of the things that we've seen in special investigations, it's not legitimate. So can you talk a little bit about what Horizon is doing to get a handle on and prevent healthcare fraud? 
Of course. Um, one of the things that we pride ourselves on is our collaboration with state and federal law enforcement. Um, we have um, cooperative agreements with you know, agencies such as the FBI, the Office of Inspector General. We deal with state agencies, the Office of the Insurance Fraud Prosecutor. So we work directly with them, especially in strong instances of fraud, where we will make that referral to law enforcement um, to help us uh, to move forward. I mean, we look at every allegation, no matter how large or small it is, because you just never know. Some of our cases that we've handled actually have started with the smallest referrals. Trust that gut and pick up the phone, and if it's nothing, no harm in calling and saying, hey, is this right? Absolutely. Just remain vigilant. And like I said, trust your gut feeling. That's what I do. I always trust it. You're usually on the right path. Great advice and tips. If you suspect something, report it. And stay with us. Horizon HealthWorks continues after this. certain times, you need someone who has your back. That's why at Horizon Blue Cross Blue Shield of New Jersey, we make sure our health plans have all the benefits you need. More ways to get care virtually. More support for your mental health, too. More tools on your phone. All in a range of health plans so you and your family can find just what you need. And we can help. Because everyone should feel like someone has their back. Not just in uncertain times. All the time. Welcome back to Horizon HealthWorks. The Visiting Nurse Association is New Jersey's largest not-for-profit community provider of home health services. Started in 1912, they now have over 1,500 home health care aides, therapists, and social workers. But how does it work, and how much does it cost? Here's Lisa Zordling, Vice President of Internal Care Coordination, to answer those questions. People do better at home. I think they really want to be at home for medical treatment. They're more comfortable. Um, they just want to be in their own environment, have the food that they want, have access to family and friends the way they normally do, and be in that routine. Can you talk a little bit about the different groups of people who might be a good candidate for the home health care? Home health care is an excellent choice for those patients who are um, in an acute phase of, a, of a, one of their conditions. Um, they're in a, they've had a chronic disease and they need management at home. Any wound care that they may need. Patients who are post-op coming off of total joint replacements, we have a total joint replacement program where those patients go into the hospital um, or surgery center, have their joint replaced, total knee or hip or shoulder, and then they come home and we do an evaluation and um, start rehab services right away so they can avoid being in a rehab center. We have a lot of ways to offer resources for patients. We have our visiting physicians who come in when patients can no longer go out to the physician. I think I was reading somewhere on the Visiting Nurses Association website that you can do x-rays at home or did I read that right? Sure, there, we've seen x-rays at home, we've seen EKGs at home, anything a, a physician can prescribe that you used to see only in acute facilities, a lot of that is done at home. When you think about home health care, people often wonder about the cost. How expensive is this as opposed to a skilled nursing home? Well, cost is always something huge and it's much uh, less expensive to treat a patient in the home. Uh, Medicare services um, pay 100% at home for straight Medicare, and the majority of our population are elderly um, under Medicare services. And other insurance companies do cover um, most of it, and occasionally you'll see a copay with that. Have you seen certain things that just make you feel like, oh, yeah, this is really going in the right direction? This is, mm -hmm. I'm really happy to be a part of this. Yeah, definitely. I've been a nurse with the VNA Health Code for oh, 27 years now, um, and I started out in the field. I was out in the field for many years. And there's nothing like seeing a patient in their home environment, looking at what the obstacles are, being able to connect with them on that one-on-one -on -one level. Um, you become part of their family, and we see it all the time. And I um, am so fortunate to be able to see the compliments and uh, the things that people say coming into our office on a regular basis now and being able to share that with the organization. It's pretty amazing, that connection that you'll never get in an acute care facility. We walk into a home and we're, you know, right away doing a full assessment. We can see the obstacles, throw rugs that are in the way that could cause a fall, um, tubing from oxygen, 
oxygen in the kitchen that could, you know, potentially cause a fire. Um, boxes of medications that are old and some medications that are brand names versus generic and people are taking duplicates. So we really see, we can see if a patient is going to be safe in the bathroom. Do they need grab bars? Do they need a shower chair? Um, are they taking care of their personal hygiene? So you're not going to see this in a hospital where someone is taking care of a patient regularly. That home environment gives you a totally different outlook. If I have, you know, a loved one who's just had surgery and I've got some options here, I'm not sure what to do. Can you give me a little idea of, of how to get started? Yeah, there? people don't know that this exists until they really need it. And I get calls almost every day with that same question. So it's very easy. Um, you can, patients and families can call us directly. They can speak with their physicians. If they're in a facility, they may be offered home care services, but it's very easy. Just connect with us. We can reach out to get that referral from the doctor. Lisa, thank you so much for all that you and your team do. Up next, Dr. Fred DiOrio, dental director for Horizon BCBS and a man who risks his life every week as a volunteer EMT at the Manasquan First Aid Squad. He is our person of the month. Volunteering is so important for citizens of the community to participate in because without volunteers, there wouldn't be a first aid squad. There wouldn't be coaches on little league fields or soccer fields or basketball courts. Being a first responder uh, as an EMT during the COVID pandemic has changed protocols of how we go about taking on call. Now my bigger concern is when I hear a call come out, I think of the safety of the crew and myself, and, I, and we need to protect ourselves, because if we're not protected, we certainly can't help anyone. We all don and PPE equipment, so that includes a gown, an N95 mask, gloves, and goggles. Uh, makes it much more difficult, you know, when you're carrying someone from the second or third floor down, down the steps, you know, in the middle of the night. Also, um, desanitizing the rig, you know, when we get back from a COVID call, uh, we need to desanitize everything that we touched, everything that's in the back of that ambulance. It needs to be cleaned. We have UV lights that we put in the back of the ambulance. We have a spray that we spray everything down to decontaminate everything. The back of the ambulance has a vent that pulls the air out. I feel more scared than I ever was going on a call. Although, what has really changed is my family is very concerned every time I go on a call. Um, my wife never would listen to my pager when it would go off to see what type of call it is. She'll say, you're going? You know, and I'm going, yes. You know, as long as you're protected, I feel that I'm I'm safe. Although they very rarely say it, I know they're proud of what I do. And sometimes I think they think I'm crazy that I'm doing this, but I made it pretty clear to them that I'm going to do it, whether they like it or not. One of the most rewarding parts of my job as volunteering as an EMT is when I get a letter. The comfort and care you gave me, a total stranger, was nothing short of miraculous. I love beautiful Manasquan for 30 plus years, and now it's even more special, thanks to you. Thank you, Fred, for all you do in your community in such trying times. And that's it for this month. Thank you for watching another episode of Horizon HealthWorks. We would love to hear from you. Email us at horizonhealthworks at horizonblue.com. You can tweet us at horizonbcbsnj or find us on Facebook. Eileen Cornblue from Coltsnet wrote, I watched last episode and learned so much from the insurance commissioner. Very helpful information. So nice to hear from you, Eileen. Thanks for the note. Until next time, stay healthy, stay Jersey strong, and happy holidays.